Good afternoon and welcome to Van Andel Institute's public lecture series, The Epigenetic Playbook of Cancer Mechanisms and Therapeutic Opportunities. My name is Val Lego and I am excited to be here to deep dive into the word, world of epigenetics. That's a big word, right? Epigenetics. If you don't closely follow the Van Andel Institute or other research institutions, you may not be familiar with it. So let's break it down. Every cell in our bodies is home to nearly six feet of DNA. It's the genetic instruction manual responsible for making us, well, us. But if every manual is the same, why do our bodies have so many different types of cells? How does one cell know how to become a brain cell or a heart cell or a muscle cell? The answer is epigenetics, a complex set of processes that ensure the right instructions are used at the right time. Think of it like a playbook one that plays a vital role in maintaining health. And when things go awry, these same processes contribute to diseases like cancer. Lucky for us though, we have global leaders in epigenetics research right here in Grand Rapids. Van Andel Institute is home to scientists who investigate how epigenetics can keep us healthy and how processes that go awry negatively affect our health. So today, we are joined by one of those scientists, Dr. Scott Rothbart, Associate Professor of the Department of Epigenetics. Dr. Rothbart is an epigenetics expert whose research delves deep into how cells pack and unpack our DNA, key in the epigenetic process. A key goal of his research is the pursuit of new treatments and targets for cancer. After Dr. Rothbard's presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. So if you've got questions during his presentation or during the Q&A, you can just pop them into the chat and Dr. Rothbard will make sure to answer them. So please welcome me, it's, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rothbard. Thank you very much, Val. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share with you a bit about um, the research that's going on in my lab um, and partnerships we have um, through uh, collaborations at Van Andel Institute and across the world. Um, so I'm going to start with a series of um, simple questions that, uh, as you may imagine, have quite complex answers. The first is what defines cancer? Um, and so we know that cancer is a disease in which abnormal cells divide uncontrollably and destroy normal body tissue. We know that there are more than 200 types of cancer. These types of cancer are classified according to where they originate in the body, but they're, each one of them is unique. And some of the features that these, these cancers share is a sustained proliferation signal. So something that's driving them to grow. On the converse, evading the mechanisms that suppress their growth, um, activating um, uh, invasion, and uh, metastasis to other parts of the, of the body, um, enabling themselves to replicate um, uh, uncontrollably in an immortalized way, um, bringing in the vascular system, and this is called angiogenesis, and so providing the, the fuel through the blood to be able to pro proliferate at a faster rate, and then resisting mechanisms that would, would, would normally trigger these cells to do to die. <clears throat> and so what drives cancer? Um, you know, from many, many years now, and more recently sequencing of the human genome over the past 20 years, um, we appreciate now that cancer is caused by changes to DNA. So these changes can occur genetically. These are called mutations, and these are changes to the DNA sequence itself. And where, where, where our research focuses is another mechanism of DNA changes, which is called epigenetic changes. And this is um, uh, referred to changes in the accessibility of DNA. And we'll get into that and you'll hopefully better understand what I mean by that. So how are, are, are these changes to, how do these changes to DNA happen? Well, they can be passed on from parents uh, in an inherited manner. 
Um, they can be caused by environmental uh, effects. And so an example being um, the, the UV irradiation from, from sunlight can um, uh, cause um, cancers of the skin that we call melan melanomas. Viruses like um, HPV are associated with uh, cervical cancer. Smoking is associated with lung cancer. And so why is DNA so important? So, so DNA is the information carrier of each of our 46 trillion cells. And so this is a very zoomed in view of an individual cell. And so our DNA is found inside of the nucleus of the cell. And the, the, the purpose of that DNA is to, is to transmit that information through these processes of transcription and translation to produce proteins. And proteins are what give each of our cells the form and the function. And so epigenetics is a mechanism that helps to regulate the flow of DNA information into protein function. So the, what I think a really nice way to start to describe epigenetics to you is to present a packaging problem. So some of you might recognize these French fries from a, from a, very, from a very famous uh, ham hamburger chain spilling out from the nucleus of the cell, which is represented as the cup into the bag. And, and why am I telling you about French fries aside from uh, it's lunchtime and I'm hungry? There's a packaging problem inside of every cell. And that packaging problem is that if you extended our DNA from end to end, it would, it would extend about six feet in length. And it has to fit inside of the nucleus of a cell that's about 10 micrometers wide, which is, is smaller than the width of a human hair. So how do you take six feet of DNA and cram it inside of the nucleus of every cell? And to do that, you, you, you chromatinize it. So you put this into a uh, packaging system called chromatin where DNA wraps one and a half times around a group of proteins called histones. And those are represented by the um, red uh, balls. Um, DNA, you can see represented by the classic helical structure in this cart cartoon. And there are about 30 million of these DNA wrapped histones inside of every cell nucleus it looks, you know, something like this in cartoon form. And so we can package our DNA into the genome in the form of chromatin. But now there's another problem and that's access. So I said earlier that epigenetics is a mechanism that regulates the accessibility of DNA in our genome. And so what I mean by that is that um, epigenetic mechanisms can change the access to DNA. You can see an example of what that might look like here. Two forms of epigenetic modifications that we work on in the lab are DNA methylation and post-translational modifications on those histone proteins that wrap with DNA. And they can change the, ac the, the, the accessibility of regions of the genome so that that genomic information can be accessed by the machinery that is needed to make this into protein. And so it's not as simple as um, DNA modifications or histone marks working in isolation. Um, they actually work in a very uh, com combinatorial manner. Um, you can see this by example with these locks that different combinations of say DNA methylation and histone modifi 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 modifications um, unlock the accessibility of the genome in unique ways um, in different places. So another analogy that we can use to describe the relationship between um, our DNA and our uh, 
epigenetics, our genetics and our epigenetics, is the idea of a cookbook. And so the recipes themselves, we can think of as our DNA. This is the, inform the information, right? The information is constant, right? This is a recipe for hot cross buns. Uh, you know, if you look this up on the internet, you'd find this re this re this recipe, and maybe you maybe you maybe you follow it to a T. But when I look at the comments on these recipes that get five you know spits five five star ratings, I always see someone say, "Oh, I loved this." this recipe and I added a little more sugar here, or I added a little more, more you know, cinnamon in this place. Those cliff notes, if you will, those red, or sorry, blue notes that you can see on the, on the page, you can think of that as the epigenetics, right? It's the way to fine tune the, the, the information. And it's the epigenetics that creates diversity because among us, our DNA, our genomes are 99.9% .9 shared in DNA sequence, but each of us is unique in each of our individual cells perform unique functions. And so this, this is where epigenetics comes in and it's a way to fine tune the regulation of our DNA to give us unique, you, you, to create, you know, that, uh, that the diversity. <clears throat> and so we focus a lot on the epigenetic processes that are associated with cancer mechanisms. I just wanna note that epigenetic processes are widespread. They're really what we think of at the root of biology. They're really important for uh, developmental processes. Um, they're really important in, in um, uh, aging, um, and we're beginning to appreciate more and more their importance in other pathological states, including neurological disorders. And so if we think about, again, this interplay between the genetic and epigenetic mechanisms, you can see here that they're, they're very intertwined. They respond to environmental cues in unique ways, either by changing the actual DNA bases themselves, or by changing the regulation of um, the DNA DNA access, um, and and that really is 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 the key to the switch between a healthy cell and a diseased cell. And an example of this interplay between genetics and epigenetics is shown on this slide, um, where with the advent of um, of um, uh, cancer genome sequencing, we now appreciate that many of the proteins that are um, uh, appreciated as epigenetic regulators are genetically mutated in human cancers. And so the, the, the DNA sequence um, that encodes these proteins is changed and that in turn affects their ability to, to function as an epigenetic re regulator. So what do we work on in the lab? So we work on we, the proteins that regulate the epigenome. And so we study proteins that write, put down, these, these, these enzymes put down epigenetic modifications. We study the enzymes that erase these epigenetic modifications. And we study proteins that recognize the modification states of our genome and are recruited to specific places in the genome based on the epigenetic state. So we seek to understand how these epigenetic changes contribute to human cancer. And we aim to translate our discoveries into new cancer therapeutic approaches. So I'll walk you through a few examples of the work that we do in the lab. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the epigenetic mechanisms that we work on um, in our lab, as well as a major focus at Van Andel Institute is DNA methyl methylation. Um, so DNA methylation is a, an epigenetic mechanism that's written by um, uh, proteins called DNA methyltransferases. Um, and it's very interesting because this is the addition of 
a single carbon, it's a very small atomistic change to the DNA um, nucleotide itself, but it has a very strong impact on the, the access to our genome. And so why do we care about DNA methylation? Um, well, DNA methylation pattern changes are an epigenetic hallmark of human cancers. And so if you looked at the DNA methylation pattern of a normal cell versus a cancer cell, just by looking at the way that pattern looks, you would be able to tell if that cell is cancerous or if that cell is normal. And so we want to understand how do those DNA methylation changes happen? How and when? Can we reverse these DNA methylation changes in cancer? And does reversing these DNA methylation changes stop or slow the progression of cancer? So one of the really exciting findings we've made in recent years is that DNA methylation enzymes don't work by themselves. And we found an accessory protein called UHRF1 that works with the DNA methylation enzyme, the writer, to copy DNA methylation patterns when cells divide. And so every time a cell divides, it replicates its genome. It makes a copy of its genome to pass to that newly divided cell. And we think it's during this process of the copying of the DNA methylation pattern that errors occur. And so if we have incorrect uh, copying of DNA methylation patterns that manifests in the changes that we see between a normal cell and a cancer cell. <clears throat> and importantly, UHRF1, this, 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 this accessory protein for the DNA methylation process is overexpressed. There's a lot of this protein found in human cancers. Um, and this is an example of, a, of, a, of some work we, we did on colon cancer. Um, these are, this is data from biopsied um, primary human colon cancers. This is post-surgery. And if we look at the levels of UHRF1 protein in these tumors, we can see that high levels of UHRF1 correlate with the probability of recurrent disease and poor overall survival. And so when we saw this, we said, well, maybe UHRF1 could be in a, an epigenetic target for cancer, th for, for, for cancer therapy. And what we found, uh, which is uh, depicted on the right in this cartoon of UHRF1 as a conductor, uh, can, uh, can, uh, um, and the, the crowd is the, is the uh, cancer cells, UHRF1 is sitting on a trap door. And we found that certain buttons certain subfunctions of UHRF1, if we turned those off, then we were able to restrict the growth of cancer cells uh, and convert their um, DNA methylation patterns from being more cancer-like to more normal-like. And so this gives us now a roadmap of places on UHRF1 where we would wanna target this protein with the next generation of epigenetic cancer drugs. Another example is shown here um, where um, we're, we're targeting what we call epigenetic plus plasticity. And what we mean by this is, as I told you, there are sort of two major, ma major forms of epigenetic modifications, DNA methylation and histone modif modifications. DNA methylation is uh, depicted here as the green bowling ball. So when we inhibit DNA methylation in cancer cells, we found that the blue, blue bowling ball, which is our histone mo modifi mo mo modifications, can replace DNA methylation in certain places of the genome. And in this case, maintain the, the silencing of a tumor suppressor. And so if this is a, silence gene, we, can, uh, we will promote the growth of human cancers. And so this gives us rationale for combination epigenetic therapy. And so, you know, basically if we inhibit DNA methylation and then we also inhibit 
the methylation on histone proteins at the same time, that gives an added benefit and turns the, the tumor suppressor genes on and has a positive effect on um, the anti-proliferation in cancer. As you can see this in the next slide here, um, when we're looking across a panel of, this is again, colorectal cancer cells, um, where um, two epigenetic drugs are better than one for slowing the growth of these cancer cells. And so in red, you can see this is a DNA hypomethylating agent, a DNA demethylating agent. In green is a, a histone demethylating agent. So in, uh, a drug that inhibits methylation of histone proteins. And in purple is the combination of the two drugs. And what you're looking at it, across um, the um, uh, plots here are the growth of cancer cells in real time. And so you can see that when you have the two drugs on board, you have a much stronger, what we call anti-proliferative effect than you do when you just use either drug by itself. And so this is very exciting. This is, this is a, um, a, a rational uh, combination epigenetic therapy that was born out of um, basic mechanistic studies in our lab. Um, and, and we've um, now taken this um, concept um, into um, a, um, a much larger project um, uh, to um, move this epigenetic therapy combination toward a clinical trial. Um, the mechanism that we um, uh, are working with this through is called an epigenetic therapy SPORE. This is um, a five-year grant through the National Cancer Institute branch of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, it's worth about 12.4 million and it supports um, myself and 19 other epigenetic uh, scientists um, working on mechanisms um, and, com and combination therapies um, um, for various cancers. You can see sort of the group of collaborators we have here. This is a, a group of collaborators that are um, uh, not only here at Van, Van Andel Institute, but in uh, inst inst institutions in the Midwest and the Northeast. And the goals of this um, grant are to develop and test um, drugs against new epigenetic targets, to develop drug combinations that enhance the effect of known epigenetic drugs, the example I just showed you there, to, uh, to, to find new biomarkers that can define the sensitivity and the resistance to epigenetic therapy in the clinic. So which patients are going to benefit most from these epigenetic drugs? And to study the interplay between epigenetic th therapy and another form of cancer therapy that is um, incredibly promising, which is immunoth immunotherapy for uh, cancer treatment. So as part of this, um, this um, program project grant, um, many of the members of this team um, have been working together um, for, for many, many years now um, and, and have been doing so as part of uh, the Van Andel Institute Stand Up to Cancer epigenetic stream team. Uh, I serve as a basic science investigator on this team, and this is an international um, partnership with both basic scientists as well as um, clinical partners with the major goal of translating um, epigenetic therapies into clinical trials. We have a number of um, uh, ongoing cl clinical trials in, um, in a number of different cancer types, um, me metastatic colorectal cancer, AML, MDS, non-small cell lung cancer, bladder cancer, and so on. And so um, in the past um, 13 years of this Stand Up to Cancer partnership, um, we've participated in, we've, we've opened 14 new clinical trials and en enrolled over 650 patients um, for treatment with epigenetic drugs. So we not only um, conduct uh, epigenetics research at the Institute, but one of the major goals, one of the major missions of our Institute um, is to train the next generation of biomedical science leaders. 
Um, and an example of this is uh, a, 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 another grant that we received from the National Institutes of Health recently, um, which is um, a cancer epigenetics training program grant. And the goal of this grant is to prepare 10 early career scientists to become independent academic and industry leaders in the field of cancer epigenetics. Um, and so we've partnered with um, other in investigators at Van Inle Institute, colleagues of mine that run their own labs as well in a number of different uh, de departments at Van, in Van Andel Institute to provide interdisciplinary training in structural, structural and functional aspects of epigenetics scientists, uh, science. And, and importantly, the trainees in this program have the opportunity to participate in these established translational research programs that I mentioned, like the SPORE and the Stand Up to Cancer program. So with that, uh, I'll close and um, I just want to acknowledge um, my team. So we have a really phenomenal team um, made up of um, graduate students, um, postdocs, um, technicians and research scientists in the group. Um, we um, don't work in, in you know, isolation. I hope you can appreciate that from some of the collaborative grants that I highlighted. Um, but we have a, a, a long list of collaborators around the world that um, are working with us. Um, uh, with a shared mission. Um, and um, I acknowledge um, grant support um, that we receive to conduct our work, both from the National Institutes of Health as well as from the American Cancer Society. So Val, I'll turn it back over to you for question and answer. Dr. Ruffert, thank you. Um, I, I love the presentation. I love the way you made it so relatable um, with a lot of your explanation. It can be a complicated topic, but you definitely made it um, understandable. Uh, the first question I wanna start off with is, which is more important in cancer? Is it genetics or is it epigenetics? <laughs> well, I'm a little bit biased, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we think that you know, epigenetic mechanisms are at, are at the heart of this. And, uh, but, but as I mentioned, right, cancer is a disease of, um, of DNA changes and genetics is a major, major driver of these. In fact, the majority of human cancers have at least one change in DNA sequence that has been identified as, as a driver of that cancer. And so I think that, you know, we can, we can definitely put genetics in the driver's seat. Um, there are, there are human cancers in which um, there are no um, clear genetic changes that can be causally linked to that disease. And so epigenetics is, is, the, is likely the mechanism that's at play. Um, but genetics and epigenetics are, are so intertwined. And so there are examples of cancers where um, you'll see um, uh, one, what we call there, one allele of a gene, um, one copy of a gene is genetically uh, changed. Um, and the other copy of that gene has a wild type or just a normal DNA sequence, but it's changed in its epigenetic mechanisms. And so it's sort of a one-two punch, if you will, to inhibit um, that protein that may be a suppressor of um, cancer cell growth. And so what makes epigenetics so important in the search for these new cancer treatments? Is it really dialing in on what that change is in that specific cancer or that specific person's tumor? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, um, epigenetics, uh, epigenetic changes are, are sort of a universal hallmark of nearly all human, human uh, cancers. And so we, we know that it's epigenetic changes that are a major contributor to those cancers. And in the examples that we've, we've had in the, 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 the sort of the, um, the development of, of um, anti-cancer drugs that target epigenetic proteins, we've seen some really promising outcomes um, in people treated with these drugs. And so, um, you know, from my perspective and from the perspective of many of us basic scientists in the epigenetics field, um, we really wanna know how these mechanisms work. And we wanna try to find novel players, novel proteins um, that we can target with, uh, with epigenetic drugs. Um, and we think that there's a lot of promise in um, 
in this, and there are many proteins to go after. And so, so this is, uh, this is really just an, an, emer an emerging field, um, that, um, has been, um, fueled by um, some early su su successes in clinical trial work. Dr. Rothbart, I wanna go back to the genetics and the epigenetics and how they intertwine. So a lot of times people will say, I don't have any history of that cancer in my family, um, but then they have a certain type of cancer. Is that where epigenetics comes in? It could, and that, that comes back to sort of what I mentioned in the first slide of environmental the exposures, right? So, um, you know, there are certainly cancer types where there's a, um, a genetic predisposition to that cancer, right? So in the example of the BRCA gene and breast cancer, um, but like you said, there are many instances where uh, a person will develop a cancer and there is no history of that in their family. And so understanding where, where that, um, uh, DNA change occurred, how that DNA change occurred, what were the mechanisms? Was it something they were exposed to? Was it, was it random chance? Um, and, and so, yeah, we think that, you know, epigenetic mechanisms are really contributing in that, in that way. So how have you seen the correlation between the epigenetic age and the overlapping epigenetic changes in cancer? That's a great question. So, um, epigenetic changes uh, occur as we age. And it's very interesting that a lot of the changes that we see, many of the changes that we see in just normal aging cells um, have overlapping patterns um, with changes that we see in human cancers. And we really don't understand um, what that relationship is. Um, we, 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 we know that for many cancers, the number one risk factor is age. Um, so, you know, the longer you, you live, the more likely you are to develop some type of cancer. Um, and so is this related to, um, the normal, um, um, changes in the epigenome that occur as we age? Is this related to, um, just the propensity, um, to, um, pick up a mutation in our genome, um, um, just because you've, you're, you've been, you've had longer, uh, time for, for life. Um, th these are really key questions that people in my field are working on now. That's a great question. And it is one of the reasons why you're trying to find like the targeted treatments. What would be, what would be your ideal epigenetic treatment for cancer? What does that look like to you? The ideal epigenetic treatment for cancer, I guess the ideal cancer treatment would be, would be one that um, uh, clears the cancer um, rapidly or prevents the growth of that cancer and has um, minimal to no uh, adverse effect to that, to that, to that patient. Uh, I think that's the best response I can give. And we've been talking a lot as it relates to cancer, but does epigenetics um, relate to other diseases like heart disease or um, kidney disease, something along those lines? Yeah, you know, ep epigenetics has been probably st probably studied the most in the context of uh, both development and cancer. So we know that there are clear epigenetic mechanisms that contribute to um, you know, developing cells. So the cues that trigger um, the, uh, you know, uh, dif dif differentiation of a stem cell into uh, a um, specialized cell type within the, within the body, heart cell, muscle cell, liver cell, uh, and then also in cancer, as I mentioned. But, but, but now that we've, we've sort of gained this appreciation for epigenetic mechanisms regulating that flow of DNA information. There's a lot of research going on in other fields, um, uh, cardiac biology, um, uh, neuro, neurobiology, et cetera, on um, the impact of epigenetic mechanisms um, in, um, in those, those uh, fields, both normal function and pathologic function. Um. 
So you probably are well aware of the PFAS situation that we have here in West Michigan, those uh, forever chemicals that um, many have been drinking in their water for decades. Is there a way that that relates to epigenetics? Is there a change that happens when you're taking those chemicals in for decades and decades that epigenetics can play a role in um, finding treatments for cancers? Sure. Yeah. This is this is um, this is not a field of research that that I personally work on. Um, but we do have I do have some colleagues at the Van Andel Institute, um, Yvonne Pondufe Mittendorf and Heidi Lampradel, who work on um, environmental exposure and the impact that those that has on epigenetic mechanisms. I know PFAS is of of you know interest to them, uh, as well as. Um, uh, chemicals that um, we find in plastics like uh, bisphenol A uh, and chemicals in our drinking water, not, hopefully not in our drinking water, but in, in, um, in other parts of the country like arsenic. Um, uh, and, um, and so, yeah, so this is an active area of research that's also going on. And um, uh, I would be surprised if those types of, you know, you know uh, chemicals didn't have an impact on the epigenome as well. And I think that makes people, um, feel good to know that there is some research being done to see what exactly is that doing to the body? What's the long-term effect of that? And as we talk about the long-term effect, I wanna go back to the epigenetic age and, and how do you really measure that epigenetic age in someone's body? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work done um, in, re in recent years, some of this being done here at Van Andel Institute from groups um, like Peter Laird, um, where, um, uh, they're using the um, DNA methylation patterns of certain regions of the genome to correlate with um, uh, with proliferative age. So um, this is not necessarily um, chronologic age, but biologic age. And so um, the, the 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 studies that have been done in Peter's lab they have been published. I would direct you to. Um, his work, but um, they've found some really interesting correlations between um, proliferation of um, normal cells in culture, counting the number of times that that cell divides and correlating that with DNA methylation changes. And they found this sort of common set um, of, um, of um, DNA methylation regions um, that have a strong correlation um, and so can be thought of as sort of a DNA methylation clock of replication. Um, now how that correlates to biologic age and individual um, and chronologic age, that's, that's something that, that you know, Peter's group is actively working on. And, and what do you mean by biologic age? Mm, so, you know, um, we, we're all our own chronologic age, right? Um, I'm 40, um, but my biology, you know, may look different than someone else that's 40, right? My cells um, may uh, hopefully are younger than that, but could be older, right? Um, and so based on the biologic si signatures, they may not match with, with our chronologic age. Right, so you can think of like, you know, you, you say, oh, you're this old, I, you look so young, right? So the likely scenario is that the biologic age or the mechanisms that are occurring within the individual cells of that body are progressing at a pace that's, that may be slower than, than, you know, others. So there's something to be said to the old adage, uh, you've got good genes, right? <laughs> you've got good, good genes or good epigenes. <laughs> in your case, right? Which is what you've been right. referring to. Right. Um, so we know that there are vaccines um, for certain types of cancer. What impact do you think um, cancer prevention vaccines have on DNA specifically and, and or epigenetics? Yeah, I mean, I think this fits into this um, idea of trying to leverage our own immune system to help fight cancer, right? I think this is a really promising um, field of, re of research. This is the field of immunotherapy. It won the Nobel Prize a few years ago um, for the basic mechanisms that went into some of these anti-cancer drugs that are now in this immunotherapy space. Um, I think that, you know, cancer vaccines or, or um, uh, you know, immune checkpoint therapies 
They're showing some great promise. One of the things that's very interesting that connects to the work that we do um, is, um, is that there are many tumor types that are um, responding well to immune uh, checkpoint, th checkpoint therapies. There are other cancer types that are responding poorly. And so one of the things that we're finding with epigenetic therapy is that we might be able to use epigenetic therapy as a way to prime the immune system for response with immune checkpoint therapy. And so some of the, the changes that we see um, inside of cells that have been exposed to epigenetic drugs almost look like that cell has been infected with a virus. And so, and so what's happening inside of the cells is that the, the cues of viral infection are, are, are being um, transmitted to cells um, within the tumor microenvironment, the cells of the immune system telling those immune cells that, hey, this cancer cells, you know, foreign and we need to get rid of it. And so there's a real push and this is, this is being driven um, largely through collaboration with the VAI Stand Up to Cancer Epigenetic Stream Team um, is, is to try to use epigenetic th therapy as a way to, to prime um, cancer cells for treatment with immunoth immunoth immunotherapy. It's a very exciting area of, of cancer ther therapeutics research now. And, and with any type of, uh, of therapy and or, or um, vaccine development, there's always some type of clinical trial. You've mentioned the importance of clinical trials in your presentation. It's, it's something right. that I'm always advocating for people to go out and, and look for these clinical trials. It's the only way we're going to be able to move forward our research. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit on the importance of these clinical trials as it relates to epigenetics? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're so grateful to the patients that, you know, enroll on these trials and, um, you know, um, the, these medicines are all being, they're all being tried clinically in various cancer types. Um, and, um, you know, it's the outcomes of those um, trials that, you know, help us, you know, decide whether these, um, at these epigenetic medi medicines are um, worth con con continuing to progress uh, cl clinically, um, you know, if, um, if, if there is, if you do have interest in, um, participating in, um, one of our, um, you know, SU2C sponsored clinical trials, I encourage you to go to the VAI website. You can learn about information on, on who to contact from, from the VAI.org website. Um, and we're, we're just, you know, I mean, we, we couldn't, um, we, we cannot make progress, um, in, uh, you know, in cancer medicine in general, um, without, um, the participation of our patients. Right. And so, um, it's really, um, you know, it's really, uh, a, a partnership, um, uh, to, um, try to find the next generation of um, drugs that are going to, um, help us eradicate cancer. And Dr. Rothbard, I really appreciate you directing people to where they can find out more information, letting them know that like, Anybody can try to apply to be in a clinical trial. Um, it, it's not necessarily that it, it's only for, you know, a certain sect of the population or what have you. If you have a disease and you've gone through treatments, you can talk to your doctor. You can try to find to see if there is one out there for you. So I, I like the fact that you are encouraging people to do that. Yep. Um, you've also talked a little bit about collaboration and the importance of, of collaborating um, in order to find these new treatments. Uh, do you think that that is the way moving forward, that we have to pool our resources in order to try to find these cures? Absolutely. I mean, science, science doesn't progress in a vacuum. Um, I think that, you know, um, our uh, co collective efforts from, from, from teams of scientists that bring unique uh, perspectives, unique um, expertise um, is, is really what it's going to take to, um, to make progress. Um, you know, I think that this is just, I think we, we preach this from the level of trainees all the way up. It's, you know, you, you can't, you can't operate in a, in a v vacuum. Um, and as smart as any individual might be, um, cancer's smarter. <laughs> You know, it's been around for, for a long, long, long time, and we haven't um, 
or we've, you know, made great progress in certain cancer types and less progress in, you know, others. And so, so really putting our collective heads to, you know, to get g- together to um, make an impact. I, I, I certainly advocate strongly for that. Well, we're wrapping up our Q&A session, but I did want to end um, with one final question for you, Dr. Rothbart. Have you seen anything in um, epigenetics research that has really made you say, wow, okay, we are moving forward and you're very excited about it? That's a great question. Um, I think that, I mean, for me, I'm a the basic scientist at heart. And so, so one of the things that's been, I think, very exciting for me to see um, are technological advances that have allowed us to um, get closer to causal roles of epigenetic changes um, in um, the flow of that um, DNA information. And, and so, you know, we've made a lot of great progress over the years through um, genome and epigenome sequencing to correlate epigenetic changes with um, processes that uh, are, are regulated by our genome, like trans- transcription. Um, but um, some newer te- technologies that have been developed, these technologies utilize um, uh, a, um, a method that's called CRISPR-Cas9 that some of you might have heard about um, as a as a genome editing tool, these technologies are now being used as epigenome editing tools. And what this allows us to do is to make very defined epigenetic changes in in places in the genome and then look at the consequence of that in a very targeted way. And that's a really exciting advance from from the standpoint of of, um, taking our correlations and and trying to get sort of more causal associations of epigenetic mechanisms with the regulation of our genes. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Rothbart, for your time. You really do have a gift of explaining this very difficult topic um, and making it easy for us to understand. And your excitement shows through with the breakthroughs and, and thank you. to come and uh, the collaboration that you're doing at the Van Andel Institute. And we're lucky to have you here in West Michigan with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for listening today, uh, taking time out of your schedules to join us. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion. We invite you to stay engaged with the Van Animal Institute um, that, we, that is being done here. So please visit vai.org to learn more and sign up for the Institute's mailing list. Um, and also make sure to uh, follow Van Animal Institute on all of the social media channels to stay up to date. So. Um, There is going to be an in-person public lecture series coming up on September 6th, and that is hosted by Drs. Darren Moore and Laurent Royben. So we will be giving you more details on that in the future. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us.